I am pleased to be here with you today. There is a lot to share, and I'm probably going to undercover quite a bit of uh, the religious history of Fort Worth. Uh, but I do want to kind of hit some highlights, particularly talking around certain themes and stuff. Of course, you know, Fort Worth, Texas um, settled, became the seat of Tarrant County in 1860. Um, with the turmoil of the Civil War and its aftermath, it took a toll on it, the fledgling town population dipped to only about 175 people. But Fort Worth soon rebounded thanks to the arrival of thousands of cattle and the cowboys hurting them. By the 1870s, Fort Worth had become a major stop for some of those northbound cattle drives. And I think you can start to see on some of the images a little bit of, this is 1876, and then by the 1890s, you see more and more structures being built, a booming business setting up shop, um, and even by 1906, there we go, whoops. Fort Worth is declared to be the fastest growing city of the Southwest. But of course, with the uh, growth of industry and eventually meatpacking plants coming in the 20th century to Fort Worth, you have problems. Hell's Half Acre, as it was deemed, that particular section of Fort Worth with its saloons, it's prostitutes and other unsavory moral activities taking place. Um, but yet, in spite of some of the, you know, the saloons that you see, uh, you can start to see a development of a downtown region. Um, and so the leaders of Fort Worth also start to catch this reform spirit of the progressive era. In 1907, the city government is restructured to the commission form and lots of people moving into Fort Worth to populate this burgeoning city in the Southwest. The diversity of Fort Worth is really interesting to look at the history, but a lot of that diversity, I think, includes religious diversity, which is really what I want to focus on today. It's really kind of hard to see, um, but you see, you know, advertisements in 1909, Presbyterians, Methodists, uh, Christian churches, Baptist, Episcopal, Congregational, Churches of Christ, Evangelical churches, all sorts of churches that are springing up. Some more interesting ones here. In 1903, a Unitarian minister is coming to town to found a church in Fort Worth. You have a Spiritualist Society meeting in 1909 where after a lecture you're going to get those psychometric head readings, you know, uh, to determine your health and everything like that. And then part of that religious diversity reflects two demographics. A Swedish Lutheran church is founded in Fort Worth. And so there are lots of different groups that are moving into this growing city that are really reflecting large segments of the population um, that are often, I think, overlooked. You know, for many years in Fort Worth, the settlers had to hold religious services in their homes. Circuit preachers would sometimes come through and visit the frontier and hold the camp meetings. Um, the first approach, actually, to regular worship services in Fort Worth came with the Masonic Hall that was built at Calhoun and Belknap Streets, where, for a time, various denominations would hold services there and kind of alternate their services at the Masonic Hall. In fact, Captain J.C. Terrell remarked that in early Fort Worth, the Masons were united while the Christians split up into different denominations. Um, and of course, the city's pioneer congregation was the First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. It began in 1855, organized in the home of Dr. and Mrs. Carol Peake uh, in June of 1855. The first pastor, uh, A.M. Dean, and then followed by B.F. Hall. In 1857, they organized at the Masonic Building there on the corner of Belknap and Grove Streets. And during the week, that Masonic Building, interestingly, was used as the first public school in Fort Worth. And the classes were taught and organized by Colonel John Peter Smith, who was a member of First Christian Church. Now, the first building site for First Christian was at Maine and Houston, 
um, 4th and 5th Streets. And then in 1878, the Rock Church was built on the site at 612 Throckmorton. Um, that was this, er, the older building that you see on the right there. Um, eventually, the current sanctuary was going to be erected at um, the site of that former location in 1914, organized and kind of designed in that Renaissance revival style. Um, from 1912 to 1961, L.D. Anderson had a 49-year ministry there with membership reaching about 3,000 people. So it's interesting when you look at four... Uh, first Christian. Now this is the old rock church. This is the first structure that they built. Some photos that I found there. Again, kind of the prominent. Uh, and then they switch. They start to raise $75,000 up to $100,000 to build the current location. Oh, there we go. And there are some of the designs and the plans for that Gothic structure, kind of the dome structure. Interesting, one of the things that I found that after the dedication of this building, one of the first to be baptized was actually the architect who drew up the plans for that building um, with that wonderful baptistry that they have there. And then, of course, in 1915, Pioneer Texas cattleman Burnett gives $12,000 for a pipe organ to First Christian Church. Now I think this is interesting because 1915 is after the split between the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and the Churches of Christ over the issue primarily, not all, but primarily of organs being in the churches and the use of instrumental music. And so for a cattleman to give $12,000 for a pipe organ for the Christian Church Disciples of Christ really does reflect their willingness to remain part of the disciples and to be an instrumental congregation. Um, if you look at the history of Texas Disciples, this first one on the right is from the Dallas Morning News talking about a split that took place in a church over in Dallas where someone was going to leave in their will money for a church as long as that church never used instrumental music in their services. You have a lot of churches in North Texas, like the one over there in Greenville, that are splitting over this issue of the organ. And Paris, Texas, I think, also has a split. Um, and, a, and Weatherford has a split. McGregor, Texas has a split all over this issue of the use of instrumental music. And what ended up happening a lot in the early 19th century, which I find fascinating, is that when the church is split between the organ anti-organ factions, a lot of the times the anti-organ factions would go and seize the property of the church and like change the locks on the building, keeping out the other progressive kind of disciples. And these cases would wind up in courts. And the courts always ruled in favor of usually the Christian church disciples of Christ. So the churches of Christ would then have to go and find other property and uh, build their own churches. So, of course, you can't talk about uh, the history of Fort Worth II without talking a little bit about oh, the Clarks. Ah, let me go back. There we go. Ah, this is tricky. 1869, Addison Clark moved to Fort Worth to teach at a school that was established by the local citizenry. And recognizing the importance of this school, his father, Joseph Clark, purchased some land at the south end of Jones and Calhoun Street between 9th and 14th Streets for the school. And they hoped to then educate the citizenry of Fort Worth. So the two brothers, Addison and Randolph, uh, began their work. But by 1873, with Hell's Half Acre kind of at their borders, they decided this wasn't the place to educate students in a Christian setting. And so they ended up relocating the college, Adran College is what they called it, in 1873 to a little town, uh, Thorpe Springs. In 1895, they relocated to Waco, Texas and changed the name of the university to Texas Christian University. However, March 22, 1910, 
A fire destroys the university's main building, and the insurance money was not enough to pay the debts against the property, and so several cities started bidding to relocate the university, and the trustees at that time selected the offer from the city of Fort Worth. So that's kind of the campus after the fire. When they came to Fort Worth, they had a temporary campus for a year, leased in the Ingram Flats area at $5,000 for the year. These were two-story buildings at the corner of Weatherford and Commerce Streets near the county courthouse. And eventually, they were raising money so that they could open in the fall of 1911 a brand new campus a little bit away from downtown at that time. And that's where TCU, of course, currently resides today. But TCU was not the only source of Christian education in Fort Worth. Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, that was an outgrowth of the theological department at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, that was established in 1901. And in 1905, the department became Baylor Theological Seminary, had five professors teaching on the staff. But by 1905, B.H. Carroll had managed to uh, convert the department of five professors in the seminary and convince them that they should make a move and separate themselves from Baylor University. So in 1907, while the president of Baylor was on vacation in Europe, B.H. Carroll who was chair of the Board of Trustees, made a motion that this Department of Religion separate from the university and eventually relocate. And of course, Fort Worth puts in a bid at the time and is sanctioned as Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. They actually move uh, in the summer of 1910, a year before TCU uh, opens, to the Fort Worth location. And, of course, they have what be, became known as Seminary Hill, which at that time was the highest natural elevation in Tarrant County. And so in 1925, the Baptist General Convention of Texas passed control of Southwestern to the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, which it still is affiliated with today. And uh, there we go. So you can see their new campus in Fort Worth and some of their faculty. So interesting that in Fort Worth, two institutions, Texas Christian University, which eventually will house Bright College of the Bible, uh, later Bright Divinity School, and Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. In the early part of the 20th century, a few differences in theological education taking place, and I'll talk more about those later in the lecture uh, as we move into other issues that kind of surround the city of Fort Worth. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time just kind of going through a little bit of some of the highlights of some of the historic churches in Fort Worth and some of the local history. And again, I want to reiterate the importance of churches doing history, preserving your history in some form of textual and photographic form. Some of the churches were very easy to find information, a lot that was on their websites. Others, I had to dig a little bit in the archives of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram to find some information. Of course, uh, 1870, the Presbytery of Central Texas of the Presbyterian Church named a committee to look into forming a new church in Fort Worth. And that church organized as First Presbyterian Church in 1873. In 1877, they called its first pastor and then eventually started uh, trying to raise funds to build a building. You also had in Fort Worth a Cumberland Presbyterian Church that began as a small congregation in 1878. And that uh, was organized. It became kind of the Taylor Street Presbyterian Church eventually. By 1915, First Presbyterian and Taylor Street Presbyterian Church had a combined membership of about a thousand and so plans kind of got underway for a merger of these two facilities um, and the congregations approved that merger in 1916 so that's first presbyterian but you also had another big presbyterian church in fort worth 1884 they decided to establish a mission church on the south side of the city and that mission church became Broadway Presbyterian Church. Um, Reverend J.B. French, 
who arrived in 1890 to serve as a pastor. When he arrived, there were about 49 members facing a debt of about $5,000. Uh, they survived a fire at the sanctuary. I think you can see there in 1909. It was rebuilt in 1911. And eventually, this minister, J.B. French, would serve as one of the longest ministers in the history of this particular religious institution. In fact, when he resigned, he, he came in 1890. In 1912, when he leaves, men and women are weeping when he resigns. It becomes such a surprise to them. Uh, now, eventually, Broadway Presbyterian Church is going to expand. Actually, in 1950, they move closer to Texas Christian University and change their name to St. Stephen Presbyterian Church but they started out as Broadway Presbyterian Church. Of course, until 1873, the First Methodist Church worshipped in the courthouse, uh, lodge halls, etc. And in 1873, though, they bought a lot at the corner of Jones and 4th Streets and built a one-room wooden church. They expanded that congregation uh, in 1890. They actually became First Methodist Church. Um, 1929, they make plans to move to West 5th and Macon Streets and build a huge building. And their sanctuary is actually opens and is dedicated at about the same time as Broadway Baptist Church. Uh, but you can see some of their progress that they're making in building their churches. You also have some outgrowth churches, Mulkey Memorial Methodist Church. I think that's, yeah. That's Mulkey Memorial Episcopal Methodist Church. And then, there we go. That's the dedication of uh, First Methodist alongside Broadway Baptist at about the same time in 1929. Episcopals are here. Uh, St. Andrew's Parish Church is founded in 1875, the first Episcopal presence in Fort Worth. Oh, that's Methodist. There we go. When St. Andrews became a parish in 1875, it included many Fort Worth founding families in its membership, and this now historic building located on Lamar Street was consecrated actually in 1939. So you do have, you know, from the mainline churches, a pretty good presence in the historic downtown area as well as what was then the south side of Fort Worth. Now the first Catholic parish in Fort Worth is formed in 1876 and that church is built on Throckmorton Street. It's named actually Saint Stanislaus in honor of the Polish Jesuit saint. They celebrate their first high mass in 1876 and also use the building as a school. Um, eventually in 1888 they are going to build a church and change the name to St. Patrick's Catholic Church. So St. Stanislav, named after a Polish saint, now suddenly you have an increase of Irish Catholics in Fort Worth who hold the majority in the church and decide when they build their first building to change the name to St. Patrick's Church. So this one is dedicated um, in around 1908. And you also have a convent operating a school, the Academy of St. Ignatius, as a parochial school is operating also on Throckmorton Street. And then they eventually move to a larger school on um, Hemphill Street and continue operating for quite some time there. And then, of course, you have to consider on the south side, too, St. Mary's Catholic Church, founded in 1909. Uh, again, kind of the growth of the city in that direction. A uh, fire sort of destroys the building and they have to rebuild again in 1924. Uh, but eventually on the south side of Fort Worth, their presence is definitely felt there. And surprisingly, it's really not until uh, 2001 that uh, they're staffed for the first time by a priest and a deacon of the Diocese of Fort Worth. Up until then, different uh, religious orders had been operating the church. So again, a large Catholic presence, that becomes important too. I think 
I do, I teach multicultural America. And so I always try to encourage my students to think beyond the Anglo settlement of Fort Worth, of, of any location. And so I think we also need to consider important in the religious frontier of Fort Worth, the black churches. Uh, you know, following emancipation in 1865, former slaves across the South detached themselves from some of the white controlled congregations and established their own independent churches. And in Fort Worth, Texas, the historic Mount Gilead Baptist Church was one of those new congregations. Over time, it would serve to meet the spiritual and cultural needs of African Americans in the city. It is the oldest continually operating African American Baptist Church in Fort Worth, organized again in 1875 by 12 former slaves who later built a modest structure in the black settlement called Baptist Hill that's near present day 15th and uh, Crump Streets. It's considered the mother church of Fort Worth Black Baptist and it soon became a symbol even of African American self-determination. In the 1920s, it could be classified as a mega church. That's how large it was. Uh, but very prominent within the African American community, um, professional scholars that are there, eventually uh, declining membership over the last few decades, had some setbacks in restoring the building. There was a scheme in 2016 to sell the church property to help expand downtown Fort Worth in the business district, but the congregation defeated that with a lawsuit, and so the church still stands at its 1913 location, kind of a, a local landmark there. <coughs> you also had Greater St. James Baptist Church that has a rich heritage. It was founded in 1895. Um, it supported a mission station in Libri Liberia, Africa for a while. It supported a special divinity school for ministers that was established at that particular church. Uh, and so again, it too becomes very important for the African American community in Fort Worth. As well as Morning Chapel Colored Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, that was founded in 1868 and in 1908 you had the Baker Chapel African American Methodist Episcopal Church being founded. And then in 1873 you also had Allen Chapel AME Church. So again a lot of these churches that are there that are contributing to the needs of the African American community and you know, one of the things about the black church uh, that you have to consider, it's not just a meeting place for spiritual needs of its members. It becomes a hub for social work. It becomes a hub for social justice issues and for political issues. And all of these churches eventually into the 20th century are going to have some impact on trying to diversify Fort Worth and to create social justice movements within Fort Worth. But I think interesting too, and not enough work is really being done on the Hispanic population in Fort Worth. You know, the newly built railroads became a distribution center for that temporary manpower, and there became a steady population of Hispanics coming into the city. In 1890, the census said that there were 47 residents of Fort Worth that were Mexican-born, uh, one that was South American born and two that were Cuban or West Indian. So it's a very small Hispanic population at the turn of the century, but eventually that is going to expand thanks to 1910 and the Mexican Revolution that forces many to flee Mexico and come to the United States and a lot of them settle in Fort Worth. By 1910, over 700 individuals of Hispanic descent are residing in Tarrant County and that population is going to continue to increase. <clears throat> now during the earliest years, St. Patrick's Catholic Church, located in downtown Fort Worth, provided spiritual guidance for the few Hispanics that were in the city. And unfortunately though, at that particular time, the Mexicans had to sit in the far right hand aisle of the church. The rest of the pews were reserved for the white population. 
Uh, but they did at least get to participate in those religious services. By 1913, uh, the population had, acu uh, had risen enough to justify a separate facility that was still a part of St. Patrick's Catholic Church. Around 1910, the Methodist churches of Fort Worth began their efforts to assist foreign-born residents living around the stockyards and the meatpacking houses of North Fort Worth. Uh, Miss Lily Fox, who was a missionary on leave from Mexico, was one of the first part-time workers. She rented a four-room cottage in that North Fort Worth neighborhood and began to conduct Sunday afternoon services as well as weekly sewing classes. A full-time missionary, Miss Eugenia Smith, uh, also rented a cottage near the stockyards and began um, with a school teacher to provide education as well as a list of programs for spiritual needs. Wesley House held religious services for adults there and once they joined, they were placed on the membership of the Boulevard Methodist Church, but eventually they would organize their own Mexican Methodist Church in 1915. I don't have his picture, and I really wish I did, because in 1914, there's an interesting man, Mateo Molina. He's an instructor of Spanish at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, while he is a student at Bright College of the Bible. So he's a minister student getting an, a theological education from Bright, but he's teaching Spanish classes for Southwestern. But he opens a mission school and uh, recruits several teachers from TCU and the public school system to assist him and starts to conduct Sunday afternoon religious and devotional services to help build um, the spiritual life of Hispanics in Fort Worth and to uh, eventually start more of their own sort of independent churches. So one of those that <coughs> came up was a Presbyterian church. It eventually um, sold into Gethsemane Presbyterian Church, founded in 1927. It was the Mexican Presbyterian Church, and this is the only part of the structure, the stone walls, that remains after the property was purchased and changed over to Gethsemane Presbyterian Church. But Mexican Americans uh, did have their own separate worship facilities eventually coming into Fort Worth. Other than Christianity, there's still some great religious history here. Jews have lived in Fort Worth since the mid-19th century. A small number of Jews were drawn to Fort Worth in the early years, and among one of the first to come was a man named Simon Gabbert, who came in 1856. And along with Jacob Samuels, they opened a dry goods store in town. Now, in 1874, they founded a uh, Jewish lodge, and to help with that endeavor... John Peter Smith from First Christian Church donated land to the Jewish community for a cemetery. And Jews eventually founded the Emanuel Hebrew Association to oversee and maintain the burial ground of the land that was given to them by John Peter Smith. In 1879, there were about 100 Jews living in Fort Worth. They were thriving in business, but they were pretty indifferent to organized religious life. Um, Rabbi Bloom of Galveston's congregation visited the city and helped create a religious school, but eventually that school disbanded, uh, their lodge disbanded, even the Emanuel Hebrew Association became inactive for a while. Kind of surprising. It wasn't until a man, a, a Jew from uh, Russia, Moses Schonblum, arrived in Fort Worth in 1877, he was appalled that there were no Jewish congregations in the growing city. And so in response, he formed, along with a few others, about six families who gathered in homes to celebrate the High Holy Days, um, they began trying to found the first congregation of Jews in Fort Worth. And they established that in 1892, Avath Shalom, founded with 31 members, most of them immigrants from Russia and Poland. The fledgling congregation was Orthodox Judaism, Judaism with its minutes even kept in Yiddish. 
Um, they were quick to build a synagogue, of course, in the downtown area. They constructed that modest one-story wood frame synagogue and even established um, a kosher butcher to help the members then maintain the orthodox dietary laws. By 1900, they had about 30 members um, and annual dues about $350. Now, although Avoth Shalom was the only Jewish congregation in the city at the time, many of the Fort Worth Jews did not belong to it. The more assimilated, reformed Jews of the city refused to, jo to join the Orthodox Shul even though they did not have a congregation of their own. But increased immigration into the city eventually led them to found their own congregation, Bethel, that opens um, in 1908, uh, but they build this particular structure. Actually, uh, 1900 is when Henry uh, Gernsbacher moves from Weatherford to Fort Worth and pushes for the founding of Bethel Synagogue, and eventually they organize and uh, open downtown. And of course, both of these congregations move out of downtown in the 1950s, uh, but it is kind of a growing sort of population that is in Fort Worth that I think sometimes gets a little overlooked. Now you can't talk about the history of Fort Worth and the religious frontier of Fort Worth without talking about First Baptist Church. Like most churches of the time, First Baptist did not have a permanent home in the beginning. They met in homes or rented spaces. In 1875, they had been holding meetings like the First Christian Church at the Masonic Lodge Hall at East Belknap and Jones. And then they moved to the courthouse for their services. But after the courthouse burned in 1876, they moved back to the Masonic Lodge and began to think about building their own home on Jennings Street with land that had been donated. Uh, eventually, in 1888, the church constructed a new building at Taylor and West 3rd Streets and moved into a beautiful building. There we go. Big structure. It's 1909 that marks a change in the history of First Baptist Church, Fort Worth, with the calling of a young new pastor, J. Frank Norris. Now, Norris is an interesting guy. He had been serving, at, to say the least, right? He had been serving as a pastor over in Dallas, had been an editor of the Baptist Standard, becoming kind of quite a controversial figure. A lot of people describe Norris, and I think this is kind of apt, as a P.T. Barnum with a Bible. Uh, you know, he's very theatrical in some of his proposals. He was a clergyman that was suited to the jazz age, you know. He's conservative in his approach to Christian doctrine and culture, yet he becomes pioneering in his use of state-of-the-art methods like radio to promote both his message and himself. Um, I think a lot of people at the time of his reign in Fort Worth, there was sort of an 11th commandment in Fort Worth, thou shalt not mess with J. Frank Norris. Um, he perfected sensationalism as an art form, and the controversy was part of his showmanship. In fact, a Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize winning novelist Sinclair Lewis, when he was researching and writing Elmer Gantry, his book about that disreputable preacher who was a master of manipulation, he made it a point to visit Fort Worth and catch a glimpse of J. Frank Norris in his glory. He had a file filled with newspaper clippings about Norris's uh, fame for the flamboyant in some of his anti-vice crusades. And so Norris, of course, becomes pastor of First Baptist in 1909. A young man coming to the city to establish himself at that church located at 3rd and Taylor Streets in the middle of downtown. And soon, J. Frank Norris was in the middle of everything. The middle of controversy, court cases, headlines, pulpits, other people's faces, et cetera, et cetera. He was not afraid to criticize 
those establishments, Hell's Half Acre, those who ran its bars and brothels and who frequented them, those in city government who allowed those businesses to flourish. And in his sermons, Norris was not afraid to name names and to name big names. Um, he named those who profited from those wages of sin. Um, and including during that time, he gets into a huge conflict with a lot of the prominent people of Fort Worth. Now, interesting, anytime you're going to name names, you're going to make some enemies. So right after he comes, 1909, and he starts his little crusade, 1912, a fire breaks out at First Baptist Church. That's on January 11th. And a fire breaks out in the pastor's home in January. Oh, actually in January. This is February. But prior to that, January 11th, there's a fire at First Baptist. January 14th, Norris is sitting in his study at the church and says that someone fired two shots through those stained glass windows. And then February 4th, fire again at the church as well as his parsonage that is five blocks away. Norris says that he had been receiving these threatening, unsigned letters criticizing his ability to comment on big people in Fort Worth. And you can kind of see, you know, it's hard to see, but if you go to the Fort Worth Star Telegram, they have some of the photos and the images of where the, the church as well as the parsonage. A timeline that's kind of there of some of the images. In March of 1912, Norris is indicted for perjury after a grand jury hears testimony from handwriting experts that those threatening letters he had been receiving were probably written by him. And so he's indicted on perjury. March of 1912, another fire breaks out at his parsonage. First Baptist even hires a private detective to try to get to the bottom and solve these mysterious fires that keep plaguing both the church and his own parsonage where he's living. In the midst of all of this, he is charged with perjury. He's going to trial for that. He's probably going to be charged perhaps with arson. They're still investigating that, and that's why they hire a private detective to come do that. Norris is offering to resign, but he has built such a following at First Baptist Church that the Board of Deacons refuses to accept his letter of resignation. They are willing to stick with him through thick and thin during this time period. And of course, the perjury trial does, ex does carry through, and in 1914, he's acquitted. So he's getting off of that. But that doesn't necessarily stop him from continuing. The, you know, the congregation at First Baptist rebuilds the building in 1913, um, and they continue growing the church. But as they're growing the church, Frank, J. Frank Norris tends to keep going a little further to the right theologically over into that area that we would call fundamentalism. And that creates controversy with the Baptist Association in Tarrant County and also later with the Baptist Association in the state of Texas. They, they call the First Baptist Church unbaptist and undemocratic because of Norris's leadership. One of the controversies that comes up with Norris um, is this idea of teaching evolution at Baylor University. He really wants Texas Baptists to disassoci disassociate themselves from Baylor University because he says some of the professors there are starting to teach this new innovative science uh, called evolution. And so he's trying to get the Baptist church to move away from that. You see, though, in the 1920 city directory, the large auditorium space that seats about 5,000 people. And it, it's packed on Sunday mornings. People are coming to see J. Frank Norris preach and some of his theatrics. Now, the interesting thing about Norris, 
1926, he preaches a sermon against then Fort Worth Mayor H.C. Meacham. Meacham is a Catholic. Norris accuses Meacham of misappropriating city funds for Catholic causes, and he does so in a very public fashion, even preaching sermons about Meacham. And so the, the feud, word of the feud spreads all throughout Fort Worth. And there is a lumberman who's residing at one of the hotels in downtown Fort Worth, D.E. Chips, who makes a call supposedly to J. Frank Norris saying, stop it, <laughs> and then goes to visit him in his study at First Baptist Church. And when he does, J. Frank Norris pulls out a gun and fires four shots, killing D.E. Chips at First Baptist Church. And this is the lumberman that is killed. Now Norris's claim is that this man got violent and charged at him and the killing, the murder, was justified as self-defense. That's his story. Others who were kind of there say, no, that's really not the way it happened. And so interestingly, after Chips is killed and an investigation ensues, J. Frank Norris is indicted for Chips' murder. There's a trial, he's free on $10,000 bond, and he continues to write sermons and to preach from the pulpit, all the while awaiting the trial. The trial eventually gets moved to Austin uh, because he, he puts the whole city of Fort Worth on trial saying that there's no way he could get a fair trial in this city because he's made too many enemies. He's found not guilty. His self-defense, firing in self-defense against this unarmed man, by the way, that was proven, Chips never had a gun. Um, but, so he gets off of perjury and possible arson early on in 1912 and 1914, and now in 1927 he's found innocent of killing a man, basically. And people still flock to hear him preach. Yeah, that's, that's huge. Now, interestingly, with Norris, in, in the 1930s, he decides to be a co-pastor not only at First Baptist Church Fort Worth, but Baptist Temple in Detroit, Michigan. He is alternating duties between Detroit and Fort Worth, pastoring two churches, two very large churches, uh, at that particular time. So I think that that's kind of interesting that he's splitting his time and of course he has help filling the pulpit when he's, when he's gone and stuff. But one of the things after the murder trial, actually prior to that, he starts to move more and more into this area of fundamentalism. 1922, he hosts a National Conference of the World's Fundamentalists that are going to meet in Fort Worth. He starts to declare open war on those modernists in the Baptist pulpits. And again, that idea of the war upon evolution studies that are coming into Fort Worth. He even has his good friend, William Jennings Bryan, come to town to help him proclaim that Darwinism is very, very bad, right? <laughs> Again, the sensationalism. One of the things, shortly after William Jennings Bryan participates in that Scopes trial in Tennessee, you know, and he dies right after the trial ends, he's gotten sick and he's weak from participating in that, J. Frank Norris hopes to kind of assume his role in the national political spotlight as the leader of fundamentalism in the nation. Um, and so they have formed a friendship. I mean, there's even a point at, at one point, Norris is bringing not only Brian to uh, town, Billy Sunday, uh, Reuben Torrey, some of the, the famous fundamentalists are coming to Fort Worth to speak on his behalf. Now again, this idea though of fundamentalism versus modernism, a split that started in the late 19th century that kind of rears its ugly head in the 1920s, is nothing new really to Baptist because TCU 
is experiencing its own problems. It's hard to read the headline, but the president of the university, Lockhart, Clinton Lockhart, has been criticized for a Bible study that he gave out in the community. He was a scholar of the Hebrew Bible, and he actually went out and said, you know what, uh, David probably didn't write all those psalms. He's using modern scholarship and science as a complement to faith to present new information, and TCU starts to even split over that issue of liberalism and modernism. Now Lockhart draws a lot of heat from the Baptist in town, particularly B.H. Carroll, who again, that fundamentalist kind of notion that the Bible is wholly inspired by God and that you can't, you know, deal, take anything away from it and insert your own scientific sort of assessment of what it is. TCU has another professor in the sociology department, uh, Ferris is his name. He too is teaching this liberalism that you can use science and faith together to study the Bible in a new sort of way and come to maybe different conclusions. And it's interesting at that particular time, there is a group in the Bible College of, of TCU that's saying, ooh, we don't want any part of that higher criticism, liberalism that's working its way into TCU. And so in 1914, a West Texas cattleman, L.C. Bright, gives money specifically to start Bright College of the Bible and to incorporate as a separate institution from TCU because TCU is becoming too liberal to train these preachers going into the pulpit we need a separate conservative Bible school at TCU, and that's how we got Bright College of the Bible as a separate institution because of this idea of science, evolution, faith going together. So it wasn't just Baptists. Uh, Christians, Methodists, Presbyterians, all of these theological institutions of education in the early 20th century are having this fight. Presbyterians and Methodists are even having heresy trials uh, with some of their professors at the schools that are teaching some of this newfangled sort of science. Another thing, back to First Baptist though, I think it's interesting when we talk about race relations. When Norris is indicted on murder, its members of the clan rally to support him. One of the members of his own church, a man by the name of, um, oh, I can't remember, Lachlan, I think, is preaching sometimes when Norris is absent, and he's a grand dragon with the KKK. And yet he's filling the pulpit in Norris's absence on Sunday mornings. And so when Norris is indicted for murder and has to spend some time in Austin for the trial, the Klan holds their own rally in support of him. Uh, once he returns, two men from the Klan, in their garb, go to the church during a Sunday morning service to present roses to the pastor to show their appreciation. And then, <laughs> interesting, when the... KKK headquarters in Fort Worth, the building itself catches on fire uh, and they're going to have to rebuild. Norris offers First Baptist Church auditorium as a place for them to meet and to do their programs. So there's an interesting connection between the KKK at this time and Norris and First Baptist Church. But I also find it interesting because the KKK in the 1920s has sort of expanded. It's not just targeting blacks. It's becoming much more anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish. And of course, Norris and Meacham, the Catholic mayor of Fort Worth, are, are at odds. Because I found this is interesting. 1923, one of the African-American churches in town is celebrating an anniversary and J. Frank Norris gets to preach the sermon at that anniversary celebration. So I'm not sure at this point that 
The KKK affiliation is necessarily, at least in Texas, quite targeting African Americans as much as perhaps Catholic and Jews. But, again, it's not just Baptists that are associated with the KKK. In 1919, a Dallas couple, A.C. Parker and his wife, donate $30,000 for the building of a flagship church at Texas Christian University, that church will become University Christian Church, right across the street from the campus. So $30,000 from A.C. Parker of Dallas. A.C. Parker, it's hard to read here. A 45-year-old insurance company director and oilman who lived uh, King's Highway in Dallas was a cyclops in the KKK <laughs> and led the procession in 1924 dressed in robes and hoods around the old, in Oak, old Oak Cliff downtown area. So the same man that gives $30,000 to build University Christian Church in Fort Worth is a cyclops with the KKK and participating in parades and rallies in Dallas dressed in his garb as well. So again, it's a fascinating kind of time of, you know, race relations and things that are going on. Again, you know, there is so much um, to the religious history of Fort Worth. I think it's important for churches as you look into your own religious history, one of the things that I would say to you, don't forget to consider the good and the bad. You know, every, every church has skeletons in its closet. Every church has had some sort of conflict and controversy, sometimes that has caused churches to split and to form other congregations, and at other times um, has really kind of done some wonderful things for social justice issues in this city to help promote a better living environment for all people. So as you look at your own local congregations and faith institutions, I would ask you to consider again, when you're doing some of the research, both good and bad. And I think, it's, again, it is important to document to try to pour through some of these archives from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, some of your own church records, looking through the minutes of different meetings, business meetings, congregational meetings, and trying to figure out what issues are important to the church and what issues kind of frame a broader political and social cultural environment that's taking place. You know, Christian church disciples, Baptists, are not the only ones encountering fundamentalism versus modernism in the early 1920s. They're not the only ones with KKK members uh, that are giving. So again, don't exclude some of those negative things in the history because I think that's just as important and sometimes just as revealing. Um, but I know our emphasis is trying to say, ooh, yay for us, we're so wonderful when we write those histories. But again, be a little more realistic, I think, when you examine things. Again, I know I have kind of uh, short-covered everything in the religious frontier of Fort Worth. There is so, so much. And I hope at some point, perhaps maybe some people can start taking some of these local church histories and start to combine them together into one big narrative of the religious history of Fort Worth, Texas. It's an interesting place to study late 19th, early 20th century, you have such a diverse range of different groups that are here, whether it be you know, racial and ethnic groups contributing with their religious practices, or whether it be denominational institutions that are here contributing. Um, so I hope that maybe I've shared something with you that you have found interesting and might be inspired uh, to do a little more research. But I do want to open it up for conversation, questions, and, and things like that. So I, I can't see right now with the light, but hopefully we can maybe turn some lights on.